Well, hi. Um, I'm Michelle Namid. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my work uh, and my illustrated book, Bruja, which uh, means witch in Spanish. Uh, so this is an uh, early watercolor painting from uh, my high school days. Uh, it's me uh, on a boat called the Pink Panther, sitting next to my grandmother, who I call Booby, <laughs> uh, with my face, as per usual at the time, buried in a book. Uh, I think it was Catcher in the Rye then. Um, and we're, we're on a boat uh, in Costa Rica, uh, which is where my mom's side of the family is from. Uh, and it became a beloved and fascinating space for me from a very early age. Um, and from an early point, I, I really drew inspiration from my travels, um, as well as photographs of some of these uh, more telling moments. Uh, I grew up in, in Miami, Florida, um, with Spanglish often spoken at my, in my house. Um, and I took the mixing of language and culture as commonplace. Um, I spent a lot of time crafting, painting, and, and reading. Uh, and growing up, books were my primary method of travel uh, and learning about other cultures and experiences. As a pale redhead with a Syrian last name, growing up speaking Spanish, uh, I found myself having to explain myself op often, uh, especially as I moved away from Miami. Uh, well, my, my booby stories uh, provided a lot of context for me as a kid. Uh, she used to tell me these on walks on the beach, uh, before bedtime, as much as I could get. Uh, I'd love to listen to them over and over again. I never got tired of them. Um, and I was really attached to these stories as a way of navigating and understanding my own cultural identity. And um, getting to grow up visiting Costa Rica, um, where many of these stories took place, um, I really saw it as this magical space with uh, really unique foods, uh, plants, and animals really enveloped uh, in these green mountains. Um, that first-hand experience in the environment uh, made these stories really uh, come to life. In addition to, to actually being in the environment, uh, the, the generations of immigrants from my grandmother's stories, um, some that I had come to know and some that died long before I was born, um, really blossomed as these rich characters. Um, unlike my booby stories, I had to reimagine most of the details uh, for my paternal grandparents' lives and adventures through photographs of their travels. Uh, moving from Syria to Panama and traveling a good bit later in their lives, um, my grandparents had compelling experiences. Uh, though I did get to know them, I didn't get these same first-hand accounts uh, from them. Um, I was fortunate that my grandpa Henry, uh, who was an avid photographer, uh, decided to label uh, many of the photographs he took actually on each photograph. Um, and I could fill in the gaps from there and, and uh, reimagine their lives through this book set. Um, and this, this was a, a set of two books um, called Barriers, Bro Barriers Broken um, that was a, uh, <laughs> a Japanese side tone book. Um, and uh, it was really in undergraduate uh, that I was opened up to the world of design and illustration, um, and as well as the, the book studio, which is where I really fell in love uh, with the book as a form. And this was another um, artist book I worked on called March. Um, and it was based um, on my experience on March of the Living, where I spent one week in Poland, where I saw uh, various concentration camps and participated in a march from Auschwitz to Birkenau with Jews from all over the world, and another e week in Israel where I participated on a second march. Um, through that trip, uh, I carried around a sketchbook uh, and sort of did a lot of on-site documentation. And this book uh, takes some of those sketches and sort of overlays them on photographs I took throughout the trip as well. So that's some. Um, and the, the images are coupled with the words of Mordechai Anilevich, uh, who initiated the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was the single largest Jewish armed resistance against the Nazis during the Holocaust. And this book was a dose dos binding, and it was part uh, drum book and part tunnel book, which was sort of this uh, pop out in the, in the back. Um, and this was sort of another way to explore a more collective history. And with that, um, this is, um, a mixed media animation that I worked on called The Shochet. Um, and, 
you know, going off this is my own history, um, I really have this fascination with the immigrant experience, and especially in coming to terms with my own cultural identity, the Jewish immigrant experience in particular. I, I came to see a link between bookmaking and sequential art and film and wanted to try animation. Um, so that's how I got to this mixed media animation because um, working with, with, I wanted to do a short film and then working with material was, was the only way I kind of understood how to do that. <laughs> working with physical materials um, just came to me more readily. And this story was a, a coming of age story, uh, particularly involving my grandmother's experience with the kosher chicken butcher that came to her house to slaughter chickens uh, before the Costa Rican Jewish community grew and chicken also started to be sold at the kosher shop. Uh, it also highlights a girl reflecting on her future and the traditions that she might be expected to carry on. And then I worked on Rich Coast, which was another mixed media animation. And it's uh, loosely based on the account of my great-grandfather, who started off as a clapper or a door-to-door -door salesman, uh, which is what many uh, Jewish immigrants uh, worked at in Costa Rica when they first arrived in the country. Um, they were called clappers uh, because of the sound they would make knocking on doors uh, from the Polish. Uh, and they actually, at the time, Jews were really the introducers of credit. Uh, because they're bringing that principle over from Europe. And so this story was uh, an account of how he lost his truck in the outskirts and more distant provinces of Costa Rica uh, while he was selling fabric. And um, part of my interest in these immigrant stories stem from the things we take for granted uh, today when it comes to the ease of travel and communication uh, and more easily understanding uh, worlds far beyond our own. And another interest um, is from this clash of cultures and, and mix of old world customs and traditions and language uh, in a new tropical and vibrant space like Costa Rica with its a very drastically different climate and language. And um, this is a, a self-portrait in uh, mixed media. And uh, I'm endlessly fascinated by this research and these past environments, but um, in thinking about my thesis, I started to wonder, you know, what did I have to add to this or, or have to say? And, and my interest in telling some of these stories is to reflect these hybrid identities, um, both for, for those who identify with them uh, and also for many who are completely unaware that these communities exist. So with that, um, I get to my thesis, Bruja, um, which is uh, the story of a young girl from a small Jewish neighborhood in 1960s Costa Rica who, after being labeled a witch by her classmates, goes against her guarded community and embraces being one. And this uh, illustrated book was really a way for me to get back to bookmaking and painting, a lot of it. <laughs> uh, the story is fiction, but it's grounded in personal family history and the collective history of Jews in Costa Rica. Um, exploring this history as a way to reflect my own background, but also further examine tradition. And uh, for this project, I actually got to go back with my grandmother on a, on a research trip uh, and uh, visit the actual school that, that she went to many years ago. Um, and you know, research and specificity is really important uh, in the work I do and, and really helps shape it. As you can see, uh, how much that experience really came into the book, um, uh, both, um, Having that research, uh, it shapes the book both in the appearance, but also um, especially traveling with my grandmother in the psychological experience um, of an outsider that I, I imagine she must have felt at the time. Uh, she attended a, a public Catholic school, which was called the Colegio de Señoritas, and at time that was the only school um, that existed. And you know, my grandmother and those from her community entered the space, but made sure not to ruffle any feathers and stuck very closely to one another. Um, actually, on this trip, I was talking to my grandmother and she uh, was telling me that though she kept in touch with many of her friends from childhood from the neighborhood, she didn't even remember the faces of the girls she went to school with for years. These are some spreads from the book um, that take place at the school. And on this same trip, uh, I actually got to go with my grandmother to her childhood home 
which was just blocks away from the school, that we walked there um, through downtown San Jose. Uh, and it's um, kind of crazy because it's, it's really all uh, weirdly preserved. Right now it's um, a sewing machine shop uh, because there's no zoning there. It's anything can be anything. But um, my grandmother said that it's, sure, there was a few new coats of paint, but all the tiles and the outlay of the house was the same. Um, and I thought, you know, it's, this is a very weirdly preserved world where time moves ahead, but not much changes, you know, for better or worse, <laughs> or, or neutral. Uh, and also you can see how much uh, that experience shaped, you know, the, the look of the book. Uh, and with this project, um, you know, it also comes to my questioning of tradition and ritual. Uh, my grandmother grew up in a way more uh, tight-knit and sheltered community in Costa Rica than the one that I experienced growing up in Miami and in the States. Um, and my, most of my disagreements with my grandmother uh, stem from this divide in the way we grew up, um, including you know, topics of marriage and holiday observances. Um, though we enjoy these discussions, and I think it's taken all these years to finally understand that there's some things we, we won't agree on, and it has a lot to do with, with the communities we grew up in and that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, I respect ideas of, of um, wanting to marry someone of the same faith, uh, if it's important to you, or um, following religious customs, if you have those convictions and belief, but uh, I never quite related the same way my grandmother did to those feelings of guilt or responsibility that seem to be the primary motivators for, for some. Uh, I also found it odd that, that Jewish tradition has questioning at its core, but I also observed how some in these more staunchly traditional communities uh, never thought to question following exactly what their parents did. Uh, and in my story, I was thinking about sheltering and how much really um, preserves culture and how much is a forced disconnect from the outside world. Um, and I can, I can really empathize with the fear um, that many must have felt at the time um, as these sort of possibly unwanted immigrants. Um, but I was I'm curious about, you know, when is it time to, to rise above that fear and, and reach out to people that are not you, you know? Uh, and so with this story, I'm sort of redefining and experimenting when it comes to identity, um, just like my character, Esther, and um, facing my own qualms and questions when it came to my background and engaging with others uh, that might be unfamiliar. So these are some more spreads from the book. Um, and the book also touches on the idea of bullying that sort of stems from this fear. Um, and you can see some of that starting to happen um, on these spreads. And um, in a lot of this, I'm addressing issues of lack of curiosity and communication with the other that really f is the root of furthering that fear. And this is uh, my protagonist, Esther, on her bed. You know, she's, she's growing up and this is her kind of angsty, um, and she's going through all this sort of awkward experimentation and, and struggling to come to terms with both uh, what's important to her, but also challenging the, the status quo. And these are, this is uh, Esther's potions in her garden, um, and this is some of my process for the, the gouache painting that I did for, throughout the book, there's a few spots of ink, but mostly it was all full color gouache. Uh, throughout. And this is um, Esther in her garden. Um, this is Esther's primary space of contemplation and experimentation. Um, and it's the inspiration for my installation, which uh, you all can see downstairs and sit in the tree to read and reflect. Yeah, so she's asking what kind of research I did about witchcraft. Um, so that was interesting because I go into spirals of research where if I get any sort of idea, I go down a rabbit hole. And I did a lot, but I also, um, in being specific about my character and her world, um, and that's something that might be a little misleading until you read the book, um, she kind of gravitates towards witchcraft, but she has no grounding in it. She really only has the world that she lives in to draw from. So that's both her 
home upbringing and her community, which is a Jewish community, and her Catholic school, and the books that are available there, and things like recipes. So it's kind of this made-up witchcraft. So while I did draw from sort of ideas of looking at witchcraft as something to gain a sense of control when you don't have one, or, or to um, work with the, the natural world, which is something she does have access to, um, there's no... In this story, there's not like an authority on witchcraft. Um, it's something that she's generating from a mashing up of what's around her, um, just knowing that it's something other than, than those sort of authoritative views. Um, and, and the idea also is like, if I don't know, when I was a kid a lot, I used to make all kinds of potions and things just from things I had lying around the house, um, thinking they would work for like healing cuts and um, so it's a lot of that kind of magic that's more um, thought about than anything that's like something's telling you is the, the right spell or the right. But I did do a lot of research on that, and uh, now I know where to go in New York to get all sorts of kind of uh, interesting things. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're asking about working with primary sources and, and how to, you know, people are natural, they go off tangents, how to, how to rein them in. It's tough. I mean, it's, it is part of that editing process. And I think, actually, it's hard to do with something like, like a thesis. And that's also partially why this was fiction. I mean, I would love, I love real stories as well. Just, um, and I would love to spend time just working with people, sitting with them, and then figuring out what the story is. But it's when you know, kind of going in. And actually, with my, with my animated short, The Shochet, actually, it was a recording from a story my grandmother had told. But luckily, she had started writing her stories down. So when I first got the idea to make an animated short from her written words, I knew I wanted her telling it. Sorry. <laughs> I knew I wanted her telling it. But of course, when I started talking to her, like, oh, just tell me that story, even though I've read it, she started wanting to like teach a lesson or like do it in ways I'm like, no, 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 that's not going to work. So of course, I, I had the two versions of, of her just talking and maybe doing some sort of lesson-y stuff. And then I wrote a script based on, uh, based on the story she had wrote and sort of mashed up those to, to make kind of the story that I thought was right and not try, trying to teach anything in the same ways. I mean, besides the definition of the word. And I think it's hard. That just takes time and editing. You can't, for some of those best things, it's you don't really want to tell people what to say because then you miss those sort of like magic things they come across. I think just making people feel comfortable and like they're, they're not on the spot, um, like they don't have to, be, they're not supposed to be saying anything because I feel like when people think so much in the context, I mean, if you have questions that are leading or kind of get to a certain subject you want to get to, that can be helpful. But otherwise, it's, it's just you have to comb through the material because um, you never know what people are going to say and especially when they feel like, Oh, I'm on the spot. You know, when I think that's also it's totally different if you're just like a fly on the wall, and and observing a, a certain ritual or customs. That's a there's there's so many ways to go about it, and it's just it's that editing, and um, you can do sort of a mashup of the very curated, like just answer this question or like say this if I want to record you saying this um, from something you said before, before, and the more um, just natural. Yeah, there's no right. There's no right way to do it, just editing, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> so she's seen a lot of it through uh, drafts, and she was definitely a, a part of a lot of that. She hasn't seen the final printed book yet, because that was a more recent edition. Um, she, she was with me as I was painting some spreads while traveling with her. Um, but no, she hasn't seen the final thing yet. I kind of wanted to save it for when it was, she saw process, and now I just want her to see the whole thing uh, all together. <laughs> right. She actually, so the, the, in terms of uh, my grandmother's thoughts on uh, supposedly coming from a more religious uh, family and, and me being more secular and working with witchcraft, actually, um, the interesting thing is, uh, she might not like me saying this, but um, or I'm sure she said, she's, my grandmother is, and that's what I get at a lot in this. Um, my grandmother is very traditional, um, and she grew up in a way that you know you really honor what your parents did before you, no matter what you believe. Um, I don't know 
or we've had these conversations. She's not necessarily, I would say, the most religious like do in the dogmatic sense. Um, so we probably see eye to eye on a lot of things, except I don't have that same feelings of guilt. So I think, um, especially now as she started writing um, and known my work and everything, she's happy for me to tell any kinds of stories. She's not about um, limiting me. And I think she, she what, one nice thing from the discussions we have is she sort of appreciates maybe my look on the world and sees how the way that she grew up limits her from maybe engaging in the same ways that I do, but she's not, um, she hasn't limited me in any way um, from doing that. Um, if anything, she just pr provided a nice access to going back to that world and, and sort of speaking with her friends. And that's actually something I want to do later when I have uh, more time and get to go back to Costa Rica is interview many of these women from, from this community about, there's, there's just so many stories there, um, especially because many come from you know, Eastern European immigrants, some were survivors themselves, and um, they all just have, uh, you know, we can paint a broad brush of like what that, those stories are like, but especially ending up in Costa Rica, they're all very specific and, and really interesting. So um, if anything, it's that access. Luckily, they, they are not um, too rigid. <laughs> uh, Yes.